Welcome to chapter 5. In this chapter, we will discuss table driven scheduling and cyclic scheduling. So, as we have seen, the basic model of an embedded system is like this we have an input conditioning unit, an input interface, a real time computer which takes a look at the stimuli and the responses generated and then a human computer interface if at all uh, the real time system is interacting with human beings so example real time applications as we have seen we could have a single sensor actuator system where the sensor computes based on the stimuli and the parameters of the system what exactly the output should be and in comparison to a reference input of course and then the actuator changes the actual system, which is known as the plant. So this loop goes on and this is a real time loop. So the pseudocode of this system would be like this, that we set a timer to interrupt periodically every T milliseconds, let's say. Then we perform an analog to digital conversion, compute the output, the control output, and then again actuate it by performing a digital to analog conversion, which is the reverse process. So since uh, this has been discussed, I'm not discussing it once again. So of course, more complicated control systems are possible, which we have seen. Like for example, you could have systems with different periods. In a sense, you could have tasks, right? Let's say tasks one, two, three, and so on where uh, they could have different periods, let's say P1, P2, and P3. And naturally for tasks with different periodicities, different things need to be done. Furthermore, we have also taken a look at hierarchical control systems, where uh, the sampling rates vary across uh, different layers of the hierarchy. So at the top, let's say air traffic control, the sampling rate is much lower. In comparison, at the bottom, the sampling rate is much higher and there is a need to integrate all of this into a single real-time system. So furthermore, any signal processing system will have many of these elements and this has been covered in the first four lectures. I'm slightly going faster. So even in a radar system, uh, well, we digitize the data, we track it, right? So we have seen this. So the simple model of any kind of a cyclic executive or a cyclic scheduling system is basically that we wait for the input, uh, then we process the input, provide the output and then wait for the next cycle, right? So basically we'll assume that there's a single task with a periodicity of P, which means that every P milliseconds, let's say, an instance of the task comes. So let's say T1, T2 and T3. And then uh, whenever a the instance of a task comes, we wake up, right? So this would be event driven and cycle and cycle driven would be the same thing. It is just that in this case, we will set the cycle in such a way that instead of waking up on an event, we kind of wake up over here and then we set a timer to wake up over here such that we immediately catch the event and we process it. So what are the basics of clock driven scheduling as opposed to event uh, driven scheduling. So as I was discussing in the last slide, the main the, or the key feature of clock driven scheduling is that when exactly to take scheduling decisions is only done at clock interrupt instance in the sense if we consider the forward edge of the clock, the upward edge that is, then we'll make a decision here and then we'll make one more decision here, so on and so forth. So at that point of time, we'll look at the set of tasks that have arrived and then we will make a decision uh, to see that uh, uh, which tasks are the ones which can be scheduled, right? Uh, so which task to be run, when and for how long is stored in a table, right? So that is why this is known as a table driven scheduling algorithm, the one that we will discuss next. And the key point is that as and when uh, we have a clock interrupt, we basically look at the table and then we schedule our tasks. 
So it stands slightly corrected over here in this diagram. So what I actually should have drawn is that I should have drawn it over here and I should have drawn this point over here. So this basically means that uh, I have a clock edge, right? So it doesn't matter which edge it is, but assume it's an upward edge. So at this point of time, I look at the tasks that have arrived, which in this case would be the first instance of the task. And in this case, it would be the second instance of the task. And then I do the scheduling. So kindly keep this in mind. So one of the most popular examples of clock driven scheduling would be round robin scheduling. Where basically we have a clock interrupt. And then uh, we look at uh, all the tasks, assume all the tasks have, have arrived. So then we schedule all of them. Then the next time we again, on the next clock interrupt, we again start with the same order of tasks. Right, so if they, if they were tasks 1, 2, 3, 4, let's say T1, T2, T3, T4 and so on, then the same order is maintained over here, T1, T2, T3, T4. So as I have said, we will discuss two kinds of algorithms, table driven and a cyclic scheduler. So the clock driven schedulers are also called offline schedulers or static schedulers primarily because they store the schedule right uh, so the amount of dynamic computation is often negligible or zero so because they store the schedule it's known as an offline or a static schedule and it is used quite extensively in embedded applications right so if there are n periodic tasks so the schedule is stored in a table right so you store the schedule in a table like this and then you repeat the schedule forever right so that's the key idea so now the question is that, you know, if I have a table like this and let's say that, uh, you know, I have one clock interrupt coming here and one more clock interrupt coming at this point. So what should this period exactly be, right? So how long should this table be, right? After which I'm sure that the same schedule can be repeated, which is for n periodic tasks, right? So let me again uh, repeat the setting. We have a system with n periodic tasks. Let the task be numbered T1 to Tn. Let their periods be P1 to Pn. I want to store a static schedule such that at every clock interrupt, I know uh, what is to be done. And then uh, the question is that for how long should I store this uh, schedule, right? So if I consider the capital period P, how long should it be? So if you think about it, uh, it should be LCM of P1 and P1 to Pn. So this is the minimum, this is the lowest possible value of P. And let us try to understand why that is the case. So this will make for a very uh, interesting proof. So let us understand if we have n periodic tasks with periods P1 to Pn respectively then what should exactly be my hyper period of scheduling, which I have been calling capital P. So, if I were to look at it, so let me look at this task. So let's assume that I have a clock interrupt over here and another clock interrupt over here. And the distance between them is capital P. So for task one, after a given delay, which is the phase, the first instance comes. So let's call it T1, the first instance. So what I would want is that even in the next hyper period, see, see here uh, capital P is a hyper period. So what I would want is that even in the next hyper period, which is over here, the task actually starts the same five phase, uh, five units later such that the same table will be useful. So if that is the case, then what you can actually see uh, is that between uh, this point, which is if I may, if I'm allowed to slightly change the color. So between this point and this point, the task will recur many times. So since it's a periodic task, it will recur many times. 
But the most important point is that between these two points, it will recur an integral number of times, right? Because you know the task is occurring at this point and the task is again occurring at this point. So let us say it will occur k times. Okay, sorry, uh, what I wanted to write is this. So let's say it will occur k times. So if it occurs k times, it basically means that phi plus, right? Uh, so basically whatever is the period of this, right? Uh, so so let's so let's say the period of this is p1 and then so what we actually see is that so let's say that this occurs k times so there are k minus 1 instances of the period p1 right and then of course if i subtract phi so phi plus this will take me to this point and then if i subtract phi then i have the hyper period p so this basically implies that k minus 1 multiplied with p1 is equal to p which means that p divides p1 divides p right so i can use the same logic and say that all the periods divide p so then uh, simple maths say if all the periods p1 to pn divide capital p then this means that capital P is a multiple of all of them. And if I want to minimize capital P, then it has to be the least common multiple or the LCM of P1 to Pn. And that is what the value of capital P will actually be. So let us now look at the uses of clock driven scheduling. So it's used in low cost applications. So pros and cons, so it requires very little storage, very space efficient, incurs little runtime overhead. The only problem is that if we have a periodic or sporadic task that keep coming in the middle, then of course it is inflexible in the sense that it cannot accommodate them. So what do we do? Uh, well, we'll have to have a slightly more sophisticated scheduler, but clearly the table driven scheduling algorithm where the period for which we need to store capital P is equal to LCM of all the periods of the individual tasks. This is the most, this is the simplest option that we have. So the code of a basic table driven scheduler would look like this. So let us say the size of the scheduling table is 10 entries. So then every time we get a clock interrupt a timer handler, so we set the time t variable to the next time, which as we shall see, we will compute. So uh, the, the current set is a shared table entry dot task. So that is the current set of tasks that we need to look at. And then of course we move to the next entry. The value of next time that we will set is the time of the current is the time required by the current entry plus get time. So then we set the timer to the next time, which means that we are setting the clock interrupt to interrupt myself at the next time and we execute the task current, right? So what happens is that if we still have some time left, right? So if we still have some, uh, a little bit of time left, so then what we do is we handle any aperiodic tasks that we may have. So this is the key idea of a table driven scheduler, right? So let me just, uh, you, you know, repeat this once again, that if we have, you know, some amount of time left in the sense that uh, what we are doing is that we are iterating through this table. So in this case, the size of this table is 10 entries. So that's the reason we are iterating through the 10 entries. And of course, in this case, entry starts at minus one, but then of course we compute entry plus one percentage shared table size. So this is essentially a modulo addition. And every time we get the current time and add the time of table entry or time, which is essentially this guy over here. So this is the next time that I need to wake up. All right. And then the timer is set to this value of next time. And then the current task is executed. So it may be possible that I'm finishing the current task and some amount of time is still left. So some of this slack time can actually be used for executing the next task. 
for executing, I'm sorry, an, a periodic task. So a schedule table would look like this, that maybe task one, he executed from zero to 100, task two from 101 to 150, 151 to 225, task three, again, you come back to the second instance of T2. So mind you, this is the first instance of T2, this is the second instance of T2. Then you come back, execute the second instance of T1, and then finally the table repeats, right? So the table repeats, this is called the major cycle or the hyper period. So this term P that we are using, it is typically called the major cycle or the hyper period also. So what is the disadvantage of table driven schedulers? So which is that when we have a lot of tasks, when the number of tasks is very large, it requires setting a timer a very large number of times, right? And so this means that the overhead is significant of both setting the timer as well as processing the timer interrupt and, you know, <clears throat> working in response to it. So task instances are short and that is why the overhead is high. So cyclic schedulers are indeed very popular and they were designed to kind of improve upon table driven schedulers. So they are extensively used in industry. And a very large number of embedded systems applications also use cyclic schedulers at the moment. So what happens in this case also, the schedule is pre-computed and stored for one major cycle, as we have seen for table-driven schedulers, and this schedule is repeated. But this is where the similarity ends, because a major cycle is divided into several minor cycles, and each minor cycle is called a frame. So the scheduling points, the points at which decisions are really made is at the beginning of frames, right? So unlike uh, the table driven scheduler, here the decisions that are actually made are at the level of frames. So this is, let's say frame one, frame two, and this is where all the scheduling decisions are made. So the basics of cyclic schedulers are basically that scheduling decisions are made within frame boundaries, the exact start and completion time of jobs within the frame, uh, this is not known, but at least we know the maximum, right? So even if we don't know the exact time that a job will take, as long as we have, we know the maximum, we are fine. And then of course we can allocate jobs to specific frames. So of course, if a schedule, for example, it is possible that for a predefined, you know, set of jobs, we cannot find a schedule. Then of course, what we do is that we can divide jobs into job slices in the sense we can take, let's say, one instance of a task, right? We, and this would be our original job. So let us say this is T1K. The first task, Kth instance, we can split it into two job slices. Let's say slice one and slice two. So then we can run job slice one like this. And then we can run other tasks which are more important, whose deadlines are closer, etc. And then we can run the second job slice. So this is sometimes required, particularly if you have other tasks which have de deadline constraints. But also the important thing to keep in mind or to bear in mind is that my job should be splittable, right? If my job is not splittable for whatever reason, then of course this method or this trick is not applicable. So the major cycle would look like this. So here, uh, similar to our discussion that we had in the earlier case, the different jobs would recur at identical time points, right? So if you see a major cycle and if you look at these jobs, right, which are nothing but instances of this periodic task, like green is a periodic task. So this is its first instance. This is a second instance. Similarly, red is a periodic task. This is its first instance. This is a second instance. But as you can see, because here also, the size of the major cycle is the LCM of the periods or a multiple of the LCM, if you would like to choose it that way, the tasks recur at exactly the same points within a major cycle. And each one of these is a frame. Each one of these is a frame. So we have kind of discretized uh, the major cycle into a set of frames. 
the frame being an atomic unit. So the major cycle of these tasks is at least LCM of P1 to Pn. As I said, it could be more as we shall see there will be some situations where it needs to be more. And this needless to say it holds even when the tasks have arbitrary phasings as we have seen in the proof for the table driven scheduler. And if the frame size F does not divide the major cycle, uh, which there is no reason for it not to, but assuming it does not, then of course the hyper period can be more than the LCM. But typically, you know, we, this is not a desirable situation. Hence, we will not consider this. So every minor cycle is called a frame. So the major cycle usually contains an integral number of minor cycles or frames. And the frame boundaries are marked via interrupts generated from a periodic timer. So in this case, we are we have a two level hierarchy as opposed to a table driven schedulers, scheduler. We have a minor cycle and a major cycle. So what you can see is that in the in this minor cycle frame, we have multiple tasks 1, 3, 2, 1, 4 and so on. And uh, these are of course multiple frames. This is frame one, frame two, and so on. So any cyclic executive would run this in response to a tick event. Where the red bar shows the time to execute the scheduler, where of course the schedule is by and large pre-computed. And then again we move to the next frame, we execute, so on and so forth. So a typical schedule could be that in the first frame F1, we run task T2, in F2, T3, F3, T2, and so on. So how do we construct a schedule? So constructing the schedule is always done at the level of a major cycle. And the cyclic executive would repeat this schedule once every major cycle. So there, of course, would be idle intervals. So they need to be managed or rearranged. But again, the key point can be seen from this uh, diagram over here, where the major cycle or hyper period is extending from this point to this point. So which is let's say 20 milliseconds and 4 milliseconds is the size of each frame, where as you can see the tasks are arranged, right? So the tasks of course have different periodicities, but that is the way that they are arranged, right? So as you can see in a cyclic schedule, uh, we have arranged the tasks for the five frames with all the tasks. And then if I were to just look at the tasks, then uh, so basically the period of let's say task one, so you look at task one is period is four milliseconds. It's because it occurs at zero, four, uh, then, you know, eight, 12 and 16. And the time it takes to execute is one, so, right? One millisecond. Similarly, task T2, occurs at every five milliseconds. And then of course we, we schedule it at some point, right? So basically what happened is that task T2, for instance, it occurred at this point, which is five, but by that time the scheduling decisions had been computed. So that is why uh, no instance of T2 was actually scheduled in frame two, but it got pushed to frame three, right? So because in frame three, the moment we started taking a look at the schedule over here, we found an instance of task T2. So it was taken up for execution immediately, uh, even delaying the instance of task T1 because it had been waiting for some time, right? So it was the best idea to take it up immediately. And then of course, we have two instances of task T3 and T4 with periods of 20 each, which means that they can be executed in any frame. So P3 was taken up for execution over here and uh, T4, task T4's instance was taken up for execution over here. So one thing that this is telling you is that the way that the cyclic schedule is actually stored in terms of frames and tasks, and the way that the tasks themselves are stored in terms of their execution time and their periodicity. So this can be R or it can be P. P is, I, I, I prefer P, uh, P for period. Also, the other thing is just take a look at this example that I showed that if task T2 is arriving here, it cannot execute in frame two because at this point, we have not really seen an instance of T2. It arrived after that. So we need to wait and schedule it in the next frame. So that is the key idea of this frame or minor cycle based scheduling. So if I were to look at a 
short pseudocode for an example of a cyclic scheduler with whose major cycle is 10 milliseconds, minor cycle is 1 millisecond. Then here also we iterate through the frame, so that's why we start at minus 1. So the tick handler is called at the start of a frame. So ideally speaking, the previous frame should have completed when a new frame starts because we are assuming that we know the maximum execution time of a task instance. If however that is not the case, in the sense the previous task is running, then of course it's an erroneous situation and this task overrun has to be handled. Otherwise what do we do is that we increment the frame number, right, module of the major cycle. We read up the schedule from the cyclic table. We read up the schedule. We execute the schedule one after the other within the same frame and we return. So as I said, once the schedule has been read, uh, it cannot be changed, uh, right? So, so, so we are, this is basically an example of an offline scheduling where everything has been stored. And then in the execute schedule function, if I were to look over here, what this would do is that for each job in the schedule, one after the other, it will just start executing them. And of course, it is possible to extend this algorithm the same way we extended the table driven scheduling algorithm such that if any aperiodic or sporadic task arrives and there is still some amount of slack space available, that task can be executed. So how do I partition a major cycle into frames, right? I have to choose the frame size. I have to partition the jobs into job slices if needed. Then I have to place the jobs or the job slices into the frames. And at every frame boundary, the cyclic execute, executive performs the scheduling. And clearly within a frame, there is no preemption, right? So we are assuming that once at, let's say, a frame boundary, which is, let's say, this point, I have decided what needs to run, it will run. <clears throat> All right. So I will not really displace tasks. Any new decision that needs to be made will be made at the next frame boundary. So as I have been arguing, these algorithms are mostly static in the sense they do rely on a table that is stored. But of course, some runtime flexibility is there in the sense in this case at every frame boundary, we may decide to slightly alter the schedule or if there is slack space available, which means idle time available, we can decide to run period, sorry, a periodic or sporadic tasks. So what would be an example of a cyclic uh, executive? So let uh, the two, the three tuple be the computation time, the period and the relative deadline, right? Uh, so basically then uh, I will have the computation time one, three, two, and eight. Eight sounds to be too much. So let me break D, the task D into two job slices where eight is broken as two and six. So then in this case, what I will do the major cycle should ideally be the LCMs of the periods 10, 10, 20, 20. So I'll set it to 20 milliseconds. And furthermore, what I will do is I'll set the frame size to 10 milliseconds. So in this case, the scheduling can be like this. So you can verify with the actual numbers A, B, C. One advantage of splitting it into job slices is that uh, we are able to accommodate two frames. So the first job slice D1 goes over here and again A and B need to be executed uh, because they have deadline constraints and again the second job slice goes here. Could we create a different schedule? Is there a better way to distribute the idle time? Well, let's see. So let us first look at this example more from an implementation point of view. So from an implementation point of view, what we do is that uh, we set the minor cycle time to 10. And then uh, we also set the clock to interrupt ourselves at the current clock plus the minor cycle time. And we iterate through the frames. So as you can see, this loop is just iterating through the frames. We look at the current frame numbers. All that we care, given that we are doing a modulo 2 addition, is that the frame number will alternate between 0 and 1. So the frame is zero, we choose this schedule, which is A, B, C, D, one. And in the frame is one, we choose this schedule, which is A, B, D, two. 
right? And then we wait for the next clock interrupt, right? Uh, which will happen at the next frame boundary. And of course, we take care of overruns. Let us now look at some frame size constraints. So let us consider all the tasks. <clears throat> so since we are even considering a job slice as a separate task, what we can say is we take the maximum execution time of any task. And since it has to completely fit within a frame, which is one of our constraints, we have that F is greater than or equal to max of TEI. So <clears throat> furthermore, we know that the frame size F divides H, the hyper period, right? So these two things we already know, right? So just to recapitulate, <clears throat> unlike the table driven scheduling algorithm, where pretty much we have a major cycle, right? So I'm just going, going slightly back into history. In the table driven algorithm, we have one major cycle whose period is P. Sometimes this is this term is also the term H is used to indicate a hyper period. So in this case, what we have <clears throat> is that uh, we have a table and uh, in, in this table, the tasks are written, right? So what happens is that we start a major cycle and then we execute all the tasks one after the other. So of course, how to execute them, this issue we have not discussed up till now. So they are not really different processes because if they are different processes, again, the OS and interrupts and so on will come in. So we assume that they are some sort of lightweight processes or even function calls that we can schedule one after the other quite easily with a low overhead. So what happens in a cycle driven scheduler is that this process gets kind of compressed to a minor cycle. So every minor cycle we do that and a major cycle basically consists of a bunch of minor cycles where the length of a minor cycle is the frame size F. Okay. So we have these two constraints. There is a third one, which is again common sense that between the release time of a job and the deadline, there has to be at least one frame because the job has to execute, right? So the release time and the deadline between them, a single frame is not there. Then we clearly will not be able to execute the job. So coming to the minor cycle, each task is assigned to run in one or more frames because a frame is an atomic unit for us now. As far as scheduling is concerned, the frame size F is an important parameter and the selected frame size, as we have seen in the last slide, has to satisfy a few constraints. So selecting an appropriate frame size. So uh, because of the minimum scheduling overhead issues, what we have seen is that the size of a frame should be more than the execution time of each task instance or each job slice, that is basically because uh, <clears throat> we want all of it to finish within one frame. We don't want any part of it to overflow. So that for us is a design constraint. The other is that we want to minimize the table size. And of course, the easiest is to have F simply just divide the major cycle. That will minimize the table size because as we have seen, if we set the length of the major cycle to a multiple of the LCM of the periods, then the schedule can seamlessly repeat. And finally, we have to satisfy the task deadline, which means that the between the arrival of a task and its deadline, we need to have at least one full frame. So this sets an upper bound for us. <clears throat> so given that, uh, the, given that the task instance must complete within its assigned frame. Otherwise, what will happen is if it doesn't complete, then there will be an overrun and the scheduler needs to be invoked many, many times. And that is why, you know, just to keep things simple and manageable, what we do is we set the frame size as greater than the execution time of all the task instances. Where of course, if I have split a job, that will come into this. So th that case I'm not handling. I'm not handling in a special manner. So furthermore, 
uh, we would like to minimize inconsistency in the sense that uh, if a job does not run till completion, then it's possible that you know other jobs may pick up partial results. There may be a correctness issue. So you go back to one of the earlier slides where I did make a point that a job has to be splittable at natural points. Otherwise, such inconsistencies will arise. All right. And furthermore, you know, the point is that if a given uh, job, right, if a given task instance, where both mean the same, it is overrunning a frame, it is exceeding the frame size, the job of scheduling and management will be difficult. Our simple abstraction will break, which is something that we don't want to do. Now, with regards to minimization of the table size, we want the minor cycle time or the frame time F to divide the major cycle, which we use either two terms, the, you know, the hyper period, which can either be P or H, doesn't matter. So in this uh, part of the book, the term H is used. So H has to divide, sorry, H has to be divisible by F or H percentage F has to be zero, right? H modulo F. So this basically would mean that across major cycles, the schedules would repeat, which is uh, clearly a favorable thing, which is something that goes in our favor, something that we would like. Right, so as you can see, so we have already discussed the same avatar of this diagram in a separate slide. But as you can see, the schedules repeat. Next, between the arrival of a task and its deadline, as you can see, a task arrives at this point when its deadline is over here, we don't have a full frame. Right, uh, so there is, if there is no full frame here, it's a problem. Then what will happen is we will not schedule the task at this point mainly because we have not seen the task, it has not arrived yet. And the second point is if we schedule it over here, it is possible that it may execute for the entire frame or more or less the entire frame and will miss the deadline. That is why <coughs> uh, it is necessary that the task is taken up for scheduling. And also furthermore, you know, it is uh, possible that the deadline could be over here. Right, I mean, let me draw this. Uh, carefully. So the deadline could be imminent. So then if I schedule the task at this boundary over here, then I may not be able to meet the deadline constraint. That is why there is a necessity that I at least have one full frame in between them, which again will make my life easier and give me provide me some guarantees. So let us look at the worst case. So we're satisfying the task deadline. So the worst case is so let's read this, uh, let's read this quite carefully when the task occurs. <clears throat> so, so basically when the task arrives just after the frame has started, so this is the worst case. So the worst case is that the frame starts, right? So the worst case for this would occur when this would arrive just after the frame has started, you know, like an epsilon time interval after the frame has started, right? That is the worst case for us. So then it means that the rest of this frame is wasted. So you better have one more frame because if the deadline is in the next frame, well then, uh, you know, the of course uh, the task has to be taken up for scheduling over here and everything would depend upon other tasks as well as the execution time of the task that we are considering. So this is where there is a proof in the book, but this is something which is more or less common sense. Right. So here, of course, the assumption, the inherent assumption is that the phase is zero in the sense that uh, the first task arrives at t equal to zero. But even if it's a non-zero phase, we can, you know, factor that in, in the sense, we'll just add the phase to this, but I'm not looking at that at the moment. So what I'm trying to say is that the minimum separation of an arrival time for let's say that let ti be the arrival time of task i from a frame boundary is actually the gcd of f and pi right f is what the frame size and pi is the period of the task right so the idea is that tasks will arrive periodically with their own period and frames will happen periodically at their own period right so let's say you know time starts here then the next frame will occur here, the next frame will occur here and so on. So if I take all possible frame boundaries and all possible task boundaries, 
then what is the minimum separation between them right so basically this is not hard to this is not hard to compute at all so let us assume so sorry no, it's not hard to prove at all so let us assume uh, you know let us look at some separation right some separation long in long time in the future so that can be expressed as k times pi so this is the time at which the task i will arrive minus k dash times uh, the frame size which is f all right so the issue now is that if let's say this is less than the gcd so let the gcd be g so let us assume that this you know just for the sake of assuming is less than g then what i can do is i can write Right, so clearly the LHS is positive. So I'm not writing that it is uh, <clears throat> greater than or equal to zero, but let's. I'm only looking at the uh, other side, which is that it is less than one. So now one thing you need to understand that the GCD G divides PI because it is a GCD of F and PI, and it also divides G. Uh, sorry, it also divides F. All right. So, uh, given the fact that it divides both, you have an integer over here and an integer over there. All right. And the other thing that we need to note is that I1 cannot, is, is, okay, so let's look at two cases, right? So, first is the other thing that I1 is equal to I2. So, if I1 is equal to I2, then of course this becomes zero. And furthermore, then what would happen is, that pi and f uh, one of them would divide the other so if let's say pi divides f or f divides pi then the gcd would either be p would either be the uh, would be the minimum of them right if one of them uh, divides the other either pi or f right so so in this case as you can see that this would be trivially true all right so this would be trivially true in the sense that uh, you know there would be nothing more to prove because this would indeed be the case that uh, the minimum separation uh, in this case would actually be zero the reason being that uh, we can always subtract pi or f and we will reach another boundary where the difference becomes zero so both coincide but the point is that this is not really our aim this is not really what we want to do we want to look at the other case which is more complicated which is when i1 is not equal to i2 because the first case is quite trivial so in the second case when i1 is not equal to i2 then what happens is that if i subtract two integers then the relationship between them right so basically we will have this 0 is less than equal to i1 minus i2 which is less than 1 this is not possible right so this is simply not possible that the difference of two integers can either be 0 or 1, right? But the 0 case we have already eliminated. So that's the reason this less than equal to will go. Hence, this case is not possible. Given the fact that this case is not possible, uh, the assumption is wrong. Hence, by contradiction, we are proven to be correct. And in fact, if we would uh, uh, like to kind of nuance this term so basically if i were to take both into account then this expression over here would basically become this which would be more correct in the sense it will capture the fact that uh, the the pi or the f uh, it is it is kind of dividing right so so basically it will also mean that whatever we get is less than both pi and f it's, it's it's basically less than the minimum so this is a term which is more correct but of course we are ignoring the fact that pi and f they divide each other so if you are not considering that case then the gcd is fine this is correct because this is guaranteed to be less than both and furthermore uh, what we have seen is that we just provided a proof 
that this expression is indeed correct. That the minimum separation for any two periodic tasks, right? So in this case, the frame is something which is periodic, right? As we saw, and the task is periodic. Their minimum separation would be GCD Fn Pi. But of course, with no one state for a special case. So now what is the what is uh, what is left to discuss? See, if this is the frame deadline, then the minimum separation over here that we know it is GCD Fn Pi. Right. So then what will happen is that the task arrives here. It arrives at this point. The next frame deadline uh, is over here, right? And the deadline after that is over here. So basically, this is the frame deadline one, this is the frame deadline two, and this is the frame deadline three. So if we just look at this distance, this distance is f. If we look at this distance, this distance is f. And the task arrives at this point. And this, and this separation is GCD F and PI. So now if you look at this time interval, this time interval is nothing but 2F minus GCD F PI, which is this time interval. So what we want is we want at least one full frame between the arrival of a task and its deadline, which means the deadline has to be in some time after this. So, so given the fact that the deadline is measured from here, so this uh, distance, which is 2F minus GCD FPI, has to be less than equal to the deadline. This will ensure that the deadline will at least fall at this point F3 or later. This, for, this would further mean that we have one full frame between the arrival of a task and its deadline. So this is how, so given the fact that this distance over here is 2F minus GCD FPI, and we want this distance to be less than equal to the deadline such that there is at least one full frame between, so let me write it down between arrival of a task and the de deadline. So of course, all deadlines are relative deadlines measured from the time that a task arrives, given the fact that we need a full frame between them, we have this relation which must hold. Alright, so now we have a bunch of relations. So let us look at what are what is everything that we have. So we have a constraint on the minimum frame size, which is that f has to be greater than or equal to max of ei. Alright, we have a constraint on the maximum frame size, which is f is less than gcd pi pi f plus let's say given deadline di divided by 2 right so basically f has to fall between these two right so the frame size we now have a lower bound as well as we have an upper bound and the frame size has to fall in between these so for instance if this is not happening then there is of course a need to split and slice and break jobs and so on such that we are falling between the lower bound over here and the upper bound over here. The lower bound arises because we want, you know, a task instance or a job slice to completely execute within a frame. And the other one arises because we need at least one full frame between a task arrival and a deadline. And furthermore, we cannot choose all the values in this range. This is not, al this is not allowed. So since we want the schedule to repeat, f has to divide the major cycle. So we'll only have a bunch of discrete values in this range which are allowed. So this does not give us a huge amount of choice for deciding the frame size. So selection of a suitable frame size, as we have said, that there'll be a couple of plausible frame sizes, frames, right? So basically for every plausible frame size which satisfies whatever I have discussed in the previous slide, it does not mean that the set of tasks is actually schedulable. What if no frame size is found suitable? This can happen. And the possible culprit can be a task with large execution times. 
such as this one, right? If you see the EPT in this case, the execution time is large, it is 20. So this will prevent a smaller frame from being chosen, right? So in this case, the only option that we have is to split the job into two or three sub jobs such that a smaller frame can be chosen. But of course, here you will have to look into the consistency requirements of the program. So all jobs may not be splittable at all points in time. What about aperiodic tasks? So the aperiodic tasks are typically run when the processor has some free time. So then it is not running periodic tasks. At that point of time, it can use some of that time to run sporadic and aperiodic jobs. Because there is as such, as you can see, no advantage in completing a periodic task early because it is nice and predictable. So if we have the time, why not run a few aperiodic tasks? Because many of these aperiodic tasks, actually they care about the response time. As opposed to periodic tasks which are deadline driven, in a periodic task, the response time is important. So why not minimize that as well? So slack stealing is an idea which was originally proposed for priority driven systems. So the idea was that we will have periodic real time tasks, which are all, you know, well managed and well scheduled and so on. So they're all, you know, nicely schedulable, but we can run a periodic tasks first to minimize their response time because they will have a slightly higher priority or we'll give them a slightly higher priority before the periodic ones, wherever possible, not all the time, wherever possible. Furthermore, we can split our tasks into foreground and background. So we can schedule a periodic jobs with periodic jobs. So all the foreground jobs, the jobs that we care about, they could be periodic and the background jobs could be a periodic. Furthermore, a periodic jobs should be executed within idle blocks, idle periods of the schedule. And as far as we are concerned, they should be preemptible. The reason is that uh, we are assuming that the periodic tasks have a much higher priority, right? Uh, in this case, and they are the ones that we have committed our schedule to. That is why, you know, in a periodic task, even if it's being run, it's kind of being run on gratis. So that's why it needs to be preemptible. So this is where we can optimize the response with some intelligent slack stealing. So of course, there are many algorithms for that. And this is not something that I would like to get into it uh, right now. But uh, what we can do is create a little bit of maths and theory around it. You, you know, some of the very basic informal presentations that we have been looking at. So let XK be the amount of time that has been used up by the different job slices in frame K. The slack that is available in frame K is F minus XK, which is known kind of at the start of the frame. So out of that, if Y units of slack time are used, then the available slack time would reduce. So these Y units can be used for sporadic and aperiodic jobs. So what we can do is we can add some extra logic in our code, which will check and run a periodic task after each job slice completes and also if slack time remains. Right, so as you, can, as you can see from this diagram, we have periodic jobs over here. So then there is some, uh, you know, so basically these, uh, you know, hashed uh, parts indicate idle times. So you see some amount of idle time at different points. So if you're not using slack stealing, what would happen is that we can schedule, you know, some of our uh, periodic jobs over here, right? So basically in these idle times, as you can see, this is an idle time we scheduled an aperiodic job, even here, even here, so on and so forth. But with slack stealing, what could happen is that we could slightly rearrange them, of course, without violating deadlines. So this will ensure that our aperiodic jobs are executed earlier. So of course, the question that can now arise is that who has more priority? Do we really care? Well, in for the case of slack stealing, we would like to execute our aperiodic jobs as soon as possible, primarily because we would like to minimize the response time. 
and also given the fact that we have a schedule which is giving us good guarantees well then why not so in this case as you can see we have even split the job into two parts because these are primarily preemptible jobs so as you can see a degree of splitting has happened and also these jobs are being executed earlier which is minimizing the response time even uh, more examples so we have a cyclic schedule here on top so you can see some idle spaces so the periodic tasks are coming in over here and then without slack stealing our periodic jobs run over here but with slack stealing we have kind of been able to bump them uh, to the beginning which is creating a feasible schedule no doubt but also minimizing the response time how do i handle frame overruns well an overrun may occasionally occur particularly if my prediction regarding the execution time has gone wrong my input data is unusual there was some sort of an error or fault or some such condition right where the job execution time exceeded the maximum execution time we have several options if this happens the first is we can abort the overrun job and we can report the premature termination of the job and we can just say that look it didn't complete and i didn't have the time to complete so too bad the other is just in case there has been a job overrun we preempt the job over there assuming it's possible to do so and the remaining part is kind of downgraded to an aperiodic job whose again whose response time is something that we would like to minimize this ni nicely fits into a narrative of slack stealing and it is scheduled later so this also can be done because we don't want the effort we don't want the effect to cascade and keep uh, delaying other jobs and then make them miss their deadlines and so on so more changes so basically you know jobs may be added or removed the computation time may be adjusted so this is something that can happen will happen so there would be a need to change the schedule we can either do it immediately in the sense freeze the tables and then uh, just update them or wait till the current action computes current frame compute current frame completes i'm sorry or the current major cycle completes right uh, so we will have to wait to ensure to find an opportune time where the schedule can be changed what are the pros and cons of cyclic schedulers well they are simple and efficient similar to table driven schedulers it is just that here as opposed to a table driven scheduler there are more of these decision points we can extend cyclic schedulers to handle more complex constraints such as precedence constraints or the minimization of jitter when there is a context switch for instance the problem is that when for a large number of tasks the finding a frame size becomes quite difficult so basically we have already we have too many caveats on the frame size so if you have a large number of tasks finding a frame size becomes quite difficult which will result in suboptimal schedules and the cpu time will be wasted in many frames which results in very poor schedulability so what are the cons or the negative effects of cyclic schedulers they are inflexible uh, difficult to modify maintain and as i said as and when the requirements change uh the there is a need to freeze everything and update the scheduling tables and overrun can cause the system to fail even though we did discuss methods to handle that and again handling sporadic and aperiodic tasks is difficult not very hard but difficult so what would a generalized task scheduler as such look at it will look at all kinds of tasks periodic aperiodic sporadic it will effectively use the slack time of unused frames for scheduling sporadic and aperiodic tasks as and when they arise right and finally if i were to show the pseudo code which is something that uh, we always do so we had done the same for a table driven scheduler as well so what we do is we find the current task from the schedule table again increment the index of the current task modulo n dispatch the current task set 
After that, look at the Slack. First schedule sporadic tasks, then a periodic tasks, and then just idle until you know the next boundary comes up, whatsoever it may be, frame boundary or the hyper period boundary. All right. So again, there is a little bit of a, choi a choice or a discussion between preemptive and non-preemptive scheduling. So preemptive scheduling is in a sense event driven in the sense that if let's say a task is running, something happens, we decide to break it, right? We did do that. We did, uh, we did that when particularly a task, there was an overrun and then we used the frame timer as the event to break a task and then create a periodic task and a periodic task. So this was done. It can provide us with good response times occasionally. But this does require considerable computational resources, particularly if we are considering preemption. Because recall that we did break jobs into job slices, but that was static. It was not dynamic. Doing it dynamically just increases the amount of scheduling overhead, thinking over it, processing overhead. Non-preemptive scheduling algorithms like the ones that we looked at, which means that scheduling decisions are only made after a task completion. And also, uh, when the execution times are more or less of the same order of the task switching times, then uh, it's reasonable. If let's say the task switching time is very little, right? So let's assume it's as close to zero. Then of course we can look at preemptive scheduling, right? So then pre preemption is not a bad idea because then as we shall see in the next lecture, very optimal algorithms do exist. But particularly when switching a task and so on is high, we would like to compute a static schedule and just go ahead with it. It will be much easier. And furthermore, this is far simpler, less computational resources are needed. A disadvantage, of course, is the lack of flexibility, right? A preemptive scheduling algorithm is always more flexible. It's always more adaptive at the cost of computation. So this can lead to starvation, which means the deadline is not met especially for many high priority tasks, which is something that we'll continue to look at. So the current lecture ends over here. In the next lecture, we'll look at a very classic real-time scheduling algorithm known as EDF or earliest deadline first.